Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. In this episode, we're going to talk about the Canon C300 Mark II. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. My name is Serge Ramelli. I am a French photographer living in Paris and also living in Los Angeles, a very sunny city. I'm here with my friend Dare from Dare Cinema, and um, we've been working together on uh, on making movies. This channel is usually about photography, but today I want to talk to you about uh, a movie we just made, and I want to talk to you about a sponsorship we had from Canon that really helped us make the movie with some of the most awesome gear there is out there to do movies. Right, Dare? Oh, it was incredible. This is definitely the camera I have been waiting my entire career for. It is, you know, in terms of, a lot of times you, you know, when you're on a big budget production, really cameras is, is, it's not a big, it's not a big line item. You know, it doesn't matter if your camera package is gonna cost $10,000 or $250,000. It, come it comes down to the choice that the director and the cinematographer wanna make stylistically. But when you're doing low budget, no budget work, um, I know over since the DSLR revolution that Canon started, you know, back with Vincent LaFerre and Reverie and all that, mm. um, a lot of independent filmmakers and and photographers uh, have been, you know, everybody wants the holy grail of cameras, right. which you know, you know, it would be like twenty stops of dynamic range, ten K, mm. uh, five hundred frames per second. You know, everybody wants that for less than eight hundred dollars, <laughs> but uh, which is hard. <clears throat> But the cameras have been getting better and better. And um, there is just some weird color magic that, that, that Canon has in their cameras. And, and I know we've talked about this a lot separately in terms of yeah. going over as a Canon and yeah, Sony. You guys know I, I shift over to Sony um, uh, for, for still footage because I like to shoot light. But I must say that there's one thing I'm not so hyped about the Sony is the color signature. I love what Canon is doing. I love the fact that Sony 7 r has got such a dynamic range and that it's very light and I travel a lot, I hike a lot to make landscape photos, but the Canon color are amazing and we've been you know, basically debating over this since one year where he says like, go for Canon. And anyway, Canon sponsored the movie and for videos, I agree Canon is really the best on, I mean, especially that camera because this is a Canon C300 Mark II, just came out, almost nobody has it. We had like a privilege to use it. Uh, before we go into this, uh, can you just uh, brief us uh, on what the movie is? What the movie we just did? What's, what is it about? Well, the, the movie is called The Hollywoodens, and it's basically about the struggle that artists and filmmakers have when trying to create great art with no money. And basically, the, the basic premise of the story is you're trying to make a movie in LA with no money, which in our case is like art imitating life. So right. um, I knew that we needed to have. Uh, well, first off, we couldn't have afforded this. So mm. thank you, Canon, so much for giving it to us. This mm. is, yeah. Like, so, but I knew we needed a small lighting package and we needed a very small camera package um, to be able to move at the speed that we needed to do. But I also wanted to make a great looking movie. You know, right. I didn't want to um, cheapen the movie by not having a camera that could capture the magic we wanted to put in front of the lens. Sure. And uh, yeah, and the whole thing is a, is a very light comedy where I play the the lead character as a as a French actor just coming from France who hardly uh, who hardly speaks English you know he speaks a bit like this you know what I mean uh, but you know and uh, he's very uh, over the top very European and wants to make it in Hollywood and it, it was I was surprised because it was a big shoot we had like thirty actors great actors to play the one with us yeah. uh, a lot of location that's been the dream of my life honestly I, this movie I hope is going to come out right but. Uh, we had really a lot of fun and, and that camera really made it also uh, because we just had so little money that we didn't have to light too much, right? And we could move fast. All right, well, let me clear up a, a misconception that some people have. Uh, a lot of times when I'm talking to photographers making the jump to cinematography or even cinematographers who have been working in the low budget, no budget realm, they, they kind of have this idea that, oh, I don't want to have to have any lights at all. And, and that's a misconception. You always need light to, mm. to make a good looking shot. Right. Um, what these cameras have done in recent years is, instead of needing $100,000 worth of lights and 50 people to do it, you um, have cameras so sensitive that mm. you can do that for a fraction of a cost and a fraction of the manpower. Mm. You just have to know that um, 
don't think that you're going to point the camera at something and it's magically going to look amazing with whatever light is available. Yeah. There are a lot of tricks and, and ways you can maneuver people so you're close to natural light sources. But, but um, you shift to like uh, we had Axel, which is an amazing gaffer, and he was always doing fills and yes. using L small LED panels. But then it would look like it was very little light, but it did look great. And uh, you know, because also the the, the yes. ambience feel was great with that camera because of the dynamic range, right? Yeah, I mean, there were some night shots where we literally could light it with an LED panel that's smaller than an iPhone and get the exact light we needed. And and this gets into also the 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 ISO and the sensitivity, which I guess we can take those up each as their yeah, individual sure. subjects later. But um, yeah. Anyway, so that's the movie we did. So maybe I mean the title of this movie is how to use the the Canon C three hundred and and well that's uh, the title of the tutorial. The, the title of the movie is the Hollywoods. Yeah, no, I mean just okay. Okay. we that's just did. okay. So how do we get started with this camera? Uh, that is one of the great things about this camera is that you can literally take it out of the box, and as long as the batteries are charged. You can be rolling in minutes. Cool. And the simplicity of it is, you've got a, a power on off switch over yeah, here. Which is, yeah, media off of camera. So right. Camera. You put it on camera, and basically you need to format your cards inside here. There's two slots in the back for two CFast cards. Okay. Uh, we used the Lexar cards. The yeah, Lexar the one, CFast. Yeah, CFast 2.0. And how much footage could you get on a 128? You're going to get 42 minutes at the, the highest in-camera resolution setting that there is, which is the, the 4K 10-bit 422 color. You're going to get 42 minutes of recorded footage on that. Cool. You also, it has simultaneous recording to SD card in the front, and we used X, SDXC 64. Uh, it's, and you have 530 minutes on a properly which, formatted card. Which is for proxies. And that gives you, but it's full 2K. Yeah, it's full so HD what Proxys is, let me just explain what Proxys is in case okay. you don't know. Proxys is basically like full 2K or full HD, a bit more than full HD. Very good footage that you actually use to do your editing. And then, because it's really hard to edit 4K, and then once your editing is nice, then you can just synchronize it and it just does the 4K magic. So we only look basically at the Proxys on a daily basis. Right. It's uh, just much lighter, much easier. <clears throat> right. So the... The next thing you need to do is you need to set your camera settings. Are you shooting PAL 25 frames per second? Are you shooting 23.976? Are you shooting 30 frames per second? We're here in the US um, and I shot this at 23.976. It also has an option to shoot at true 24 frames per second, which some people might want to do, but 23.976 was the choice for this. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, while we're on it, uh, I would just mention that is that, uh, you know, I read a lot on the internet, I'm in the forums, I'm watching the other people doing their videos on this and, and one of the big points that everybody's complaining about on this camera is the lack of frame rates. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's at 4K, they would expect minimally 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second. For slow motion. For slow motion. And for whatever reason, that's I've never had a consideration on that at all. And and the reason why is if I'm gonna do slow motion and I need slow motion for a commercial or whatever, I'm gonna go rent a slow motion camera. Right. You know what I mean? Because even if you look at some of the other cameras such as the Sony FS7 and the other ones that have high frame rates, the slow motion isn't as clean and noiseless as what you can get on the cameras that are dedicated slow motion cameras. Right. And how many slow motion shots that I have in the 21 days of shooting that we had, I had one. That was it. You know what I mean? So it's, mm -hmm. when you look... Yeah, it's not, it's not a deal, deal breaker. It's not a deal breaker, but mm -hmm. some people think it is. And, and you just have to think with, this is a tool to tell a narrative story. Right. You know what I mean? For, for filmmakers, for document, you know, documentary makers. Um, uh, this, this camera, I mean, we talked about it back in April. I was like, I, I, you know, maybe there's some way we can get our hands on this camera. Right. Because the image is so good. I mean, you really, you know, we'll, we'll show some clips here behind so you can sure. see it. Um, but yeah, I know we were very excited with the image quality. I mean, I've never seen something like this. So it, it's really good because this is a $15,000 camera. It's not like some of the very high end Aries camera, which I guess are between 50 or $80,000. And this is a $15,000 camera. You can rent this for $400 a week. It's you know, for independent movie making, it's within reach, you know? Yeah. And it's, and it's like the quality is really uh, it's, great. It's fantastic. And it, it's, if you had said, look, let's rent an Aerie for this film, I would have said no. And the reason why I would have said no is because you need more people to do it. 
Yeah. You can't just, you can't, you, you know, you need to be tethered to a DIT station that's set up so you can watch things back and it's a yeah. bigger camera. And this, just again, getting back to the point of you can pick it up and you can start shooting and you can start capturing amazing images. And I'm not speaking now from a point of promoting Canon. Hmm. I'm speaking now from the point of as a filmmaker. Yeah, hey, that was your dream camera. You would, you've been talking to me for months and I, I asked Canon if they would help us in the movie and they did. And we, you were blown away, I remember. And yes, no, no, okay. no question. So, right, back to you, you want to set your frame rate. Yes. And if you're PAL, it's 25. If you're in the US, it's 23.976 or whatever you want. Um, and then you need to choose your, your, your color format, meaning right. are you shooting just sort of like the natural Canon format? Are you shooting C-Log? Are you shooting C-Log 2? So that, that's three choices. Canon formats to C-Log or C-Log 2? And Cinema. And Cinema. And it's got a, and it's got a couple others in there. So, okay. But uh, to get it's, the 15 stops dynamic range that they tout on this camera, and I know that there are some people out there who are like, oh, it's not really true 15 stops. Let me tell you, as a cinematographer, when you're seeing the images on it, sure looks damn close enough to 15 stops to me. Yeah, that's for sure. So which one would you recommend? So it's like the equivalent of color spaces in photography, like Adobe uh, 98 or uh, um, Profoto sRGB. That's the a bit equivalent. Yeah, basically. I mean, it's not shooting raw. Right. Okay. It's, it's good, not right? shooting. It, could shoot it cannot shoot raw oh, okay, no. internally. With an external recorder, you can shoot raw. But, then it gets but again, you're starting to add things onto the camera, and you know. It, What's the beauty of this camera? You can make an amazing film with what comes out of the box. Yeah, that's so it, we shot cinema mode, right? Okay, because okay. that's that's you know, Canon says you want the most dynamic range, you need to shoot in cinema mode, okay? Yeah, and we were shooting about four uh CFAS card per day, which is roughly 500 gigabytes per day, half a, so we had to have two hard drives of 12 terabytes to handle the data. The whole movie is exactly nine terabytes, so we have. Uh, basically to a hard drive which is each 12 terabytes uh, and we just one is a backup basically uh, yes. and we backed up to this two hard drive so that's a bit tricky because 500 terabytes per day is something you know yeah and then imagine shooting in raw format you're you're now gonna like Woo! Well, yeah, you know, you're like, probably talking 30 to 50 terabytes at that point yeah um, on an uncompressed raw format which we didn't do yeah because we were really happy with a cinema setting right yes great great image and you don't have to Go through it, it just takes that chunk out of post processing. And again, if you're planning on doing a hundred billion dollar blockbuster, none of this means anything to you. You're just like, oh, okay, we're just gonna do 0.01%. Yeah. But for the low budget, no budget, that's that's a big consideration to, to, to think of. So 4K, highest quality in camera settings, you're gonna get 42 minutes per card, you're gonna get uh, 500 minutes of the, the proxy full HD recording. Um, and this is at the cinema setting. So, and as he said, about half a terabyte a day. Cool. And those were full days. So. Yeah, very full days. So eight to 11 pages of scripts per day. It was pretty crazy schedule. <laughs> we started sometime at eight, finished at two in the morning. It was crazy, crazy, crazy. Oh yeah, the better, how is the battery life on this one? Crazy good, crazy good. The batteries on this is, you get, uh, I'm pretty sure it comes with the two full size batteries and it's, you know, when you plug it in, the battery cover doesn't close because the batteries are so big, but mm. we were getting like seven hours solid, I want to say, on wow. each battery. There was never a day where, even if we shot an 18 hour or even a 20 hour day, where those two batteries didn't last through the day. Now that being said, uh, I did always have the charging station on site so that as soon as the first battery was dead, I was charging yeah. the other one. Security. Just in case. But you never had the problem. Crazy good batteries on this. Cool. You know, no longer would I, like, in when I was shooting, like, a lot of uh, DSLR work, I would always have, like, the extra battery pack, the 14-volt battery pack that would be powering up the whole system and don't need that on this. Mm. And one thing that surprised you, because I'm not used to using professional cinema, I think I'm a photographer, is that, you know, in photography, we, we use shutter speed, we use aperture and ISO to do our exposure. Here is a different world. Usually the um, the shutter speed is set to 1 40th of a second. Most of the movie was like that, right? And you were just playing around with ISO and um, and basically the, the manual um, uh, sh um, aperture. The manual aperture. The manual aperture yes. for your image, right? Yes. And uh, yeah, the, um, that's the two settings you would change basically. Basically, on the lenses that we used, we have 
manual uh, aperture settings, manual right. focus, and manual zoom. Now, if you're using an L-series lens, you control the aperture right back here. There's a wheel down here on the side. And similar to how you control it on your DSLR camera, you just spin that wheel and it will uh, change your aperture. Okay, but not on a manual lens. You have to do it here. Manual lens, you have to do it here. Okay. And with the can, I'll just mention this quickly while we're on it. With the Canons, uh, the camera actually records the the data of what was your focal length, what was your aperture setting, yeah, uh, which is really cool. Data. Yeah, yeah. really. It's, so that's that's kind of a cool thing about the camera. Even with the manual lenses. Even with the manual lenses. Which is not always the case in the DSLR, DSLR world. We don't always get the active data when we shoot with manual lenses. So that's cool. Okay, and what about uh, ISO? Uh, so ISO. Um, this camera in it, I believe it has an extended mode, which goes up to a hundred thousand ISO, which is ridiculous. Um, but just as it is out of the box, it goes from, I think it's 160 all the way up to 25,600. Okay. So let's watch shot. here. We have some night shots going on. Uh, so what was the max ISO that you went up to? Do you remember? I, uh, anytime I needed to push the ISO, I very rarely pushed it over 1250. Sometimes wow. I went up to 2000 because even though the noise handling is good, anytime you start going above uh, native ISO, you are going to have noise, whether it's detectable by the human eye or not. Hmm. So the native ISO on this camera is 800 ISO. Um, I'm really happy that it goes down to uh, one, maybe even goes down to 100. I don't remember, but for sure 160. 160. I think in the extended mode, it goes down to 100. Yeah, so, that, so that's something that's surprising to photographers because the native ISO for Nikon camera is 200 ISO and for Canon camera is 100 ISO. But for movie cameras, it's different. This is 800 ISO, it's a native. That's the best settings. So when they go to 160, they're sort of doing some electronic things to make it less, to make sensitive. It less sensitive. Okay. Yeah. And um, so we're talking about going up on the high end of ISO right now. And um, I'll, you know, we'll show you some footage so you can just see what it is at each of the settings. Let's, yeah. we'll, we'll show you some night footage that we're going to grab and we'll give you those clips right. so you can sort of see for yourself at, at what it is. But um, I did do some shots at 2000 ISO and, um, you know, and I could see the noise starting to come in. You know, it's, it's yeah. pleasing noise, not, not like radical. It's something I know I can run through a, a really quick denoiser and get rid of it. but. You know, it's it's not still my, my my sorry, not Miami Vice noise from uh, that movie because <laughs> okay, <laughs> we love Michael Mann. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, no, but you you make a good point because if you look at what digital cam cinema cameras were like, if you look at Collateral, yeah, um, I think that was shot on the Viper Stream, but this is one of the first cameras. It's crazy how noisy that is. It still looks incredible. I love yeah, the that Yeah, but there was a lot film. of noise. It's crazy noise. On, on a big screen, there's a lot of noise. It's crazy. And, and you know, this one, you think, is, has less noise than that? Not, it's, not even, it's not even a question. That's so funny how this has progressed over the last years. It's amazing. Yeah. So we're talking about ISO. Okay. So on the, you know, when you don't have enough light, that's just one problem. Okay. okay. And that's solved by boosting up the ISO to where you want it. Also, you can... Um, you know, you can go down, the cinema zooms go down to 2.8, at least these are the compact zooms, I believe. They go down to 2.8, which, right. which is really great. Um, and then sometimes, which we're going to show you on some of these night shots, what I like to do is I like to use the 1.285 millimeter. It gives you, I don't, it's, to me, it's magic. The, the look that you can get, the bouquet in the background, um, and this is where you really start to see the power of a prime versus a zoom, because they're, the difference between 1.2 and 2.8 is phenomenal. It's and it's not just in the way it handles the highlights in the background. It's the way that the light wraps around the skin. The, the, the you know yeah. because not everything is super sharp. Right. You know it. it oh, I love it, the look. Yeah. It gives an almost angelic beauty to to some of these. So we'll show you some of that footage. Um, now here's the other side of the ISO problem. Uh, you're going to go outside and suddenly. Uh, if you want to shoot at anything below f8 and you're even at ISO 160, it's too bright. And this has two, four, six stops of ND built in with these two, little, these two little buttons here on the side. Yeah. You just go plus, minus, minus. And I believe in extended mode, it even has 10 stops. Wow. So That's amazing because I keep putting ND filters on you know, to get long exposures in photography or if you want to make videos and you know. And you have too much light, and here it's in the camera, which is really cool. And and that is one, without a doubt, one of the greatest features of this camera because I like to shoot 
you know, between F4 and and 2 like yeah. above unless I have a shot where I really want everything in focus everything in focus you know what I mean but you know it, it tends to have a, a video look you know when and the point of depth of field and focus is to tell the audience what's important in yeah. the scene where should they be looking and when you're doing landscapes that's just part of the language of the movie so you, you want everything in focus you want right. them to be able to to do that and you use color to pick out certain things that you want so Having the built-in ND filters, you can just bam, 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 just just rapidly yeah. go up to whatever you need. So you're you can like be shooting almost directly at the sun, and you're good to go. Cool. So that's ISO and kind of the range and how we shot that. Cool. All right. Uh, uh, any other things that sh people should know to get started with a camera that's important about the peaking or. Or. Um, there's a few functions here, which is um, you, you should get familiar with how to read a waveform monitor. And both here on the top, um, you have WFM, which is this, this button number eight, which you can press and it gives you a monitor that you can look at. And also here on the side, you have one of the selectable buttons right here between peaking, zebra, magnification. Yeah, and, and we can take a each of these. Why is it important to understand the waveform monitor? There's, there's a lot of information and a lot of studying that you can do on a waveform monitor. But here's just the equivalent of the histogram for photography, basically. Yeah. What do you want to know? You don't want stuff hitting zero and you don't want stuff hitting 100. Right. At zero, the information is gone. It's pure black. At 100, it's pure white, sort of depending on the sensor. You can go, like, sometimes you can still pick out details, like, above that, but you just don't yeah. want it, unless you're deliberately trying to do it for a specific effect that you're trying to get. Try and make sure that you don't have any highlights that are going above 90. And, and it was very rare, getting back to now the dynamic range, um, this is where you, the, you start to see the camera shine because you're looking at the waveform monitor and you're seeing the face mm. and it's at you know 40 or 50 and you see this bright white background and, and it's, it's reading at like 70 or 80 and shooting DSLR before you might be like, there's nothing there. Hmm. And then you focus on the background and you still have all these subtle variations in color. It's, it's amazing. Hmm. It's, it's uh, cool. Yeah, it's great. So let's go quickly over the buttons. So the first one is ISO again, we went over. So yep. uh, shutter, now what do you, with button number six with this shutter, do you do anything with that? That's when you want to go for. Okay, let's talk about shutter speed for a second. Cool. And you can change the shutter speed on the camera. We, we spoke about this briefly uh, at the beginning. But um, there's two different ways you can control shutter in here. And one is by shutter angle and one is by shutter speed. Okay. They're both talking the same thing. Okay. Cool. And with this, you're basically controlling motion blur. Now, you might remember in the old handy cams, like how they had that old film look and you could kind of get these light streaks and, mm. you know, like dreamy sort of look. Yeah. That's a lower shutter speed. Right. So if you're down at 1 15th or something like that, that's how you can kind of get that surreal yeah. look. Yeah. Which if you're doing music videos, maybe you want to do. Then you go on the other end of the, the spectrum and you're going at your high shutter speeds and you have like Saving Private Ryan where you have oh, that really... Or the whole fighting scene with the at the... Very, very clear. No motion blur. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's basically what you're controlling. But if you're going to get into that, I recommend just doing camera testing and just use, do your, a basic setup and then go through it. Did you change the shutter speed during the entire movie? Not once. No, 148 the entire movie. That's it, because it's all this movie needed. It cool. wasn't, there was no need for me to go out that. I said it's 180 degree shutter angle, which at 23976 is 148th of a second. Cool. All right, then we have button number seven, which is uh, frame rate. Did you change this one, frame rate? No. 23976. Okay, cool. Then we have number one, which is magnification, right? Well, let's go back to frame rate for a second. And okay. again, let's just briefly touch upon that because it is, it, yes, thank you. Um, frame rate is uh, something that people can sort of put too much attention on, in, in, in my opinion. It's if you're gonna be telling a narrative story and you're, you're going the approach of a filmic look, which after a hundred years has been established, one of, the main, one of the main elements between dynamic range, depth of field is frame rate. It's 24 frames per second in the US. Okay. That's what it is. And when we talked about this movie at the start, we wanted that sort of, uh, we wanted an independent film, kind of low budget, but with a, you know, with that amount of motion blur. Okay. You know, because there are films that are shooting a lot at 30 frames per second these days because it matches internet footage. Mm. It's not a lot of motion blur. It has, 
a video like setting and right. you can get that from this camera if you want that if that's what you're going for that just happened to be we didn't we didn't want that yeah we wanted the cinema we we're telling you a story we wanted to look at cinema has been looking for the last 50 years which is a cinema look. and that helps being at 24. it does it's just 23 98 right same basic thing. same thing okay same cool. basic thing. but um and this camera will go up to 60 frames per second in 2k i believe but we shot the whole thing in 4k hmm. And I just, I didn't need it, so. Okay, why, do you, why did you shoot in 4K, just as a little thing? Why do you want this whole movie to be 4K? Two reasons. One, future-proof. There are, any digital distribution that you're looking for, everybody is going 4K now. Just because now, with the amount of displays and whatnot that you mm -hmm. have in. And more so than that, uh, when we went to the movies and we saw, I saw Terminator Genesis, I yes. think it was, which, in my opinion, got unnecessarily bagged on. But aside from that, I saw it once in a theater where it was projected in 2K, and then when, um, I think it was when we went and saw it, I saw it in 4K and I couldn't believe the difference. Uh, like, same movie, yeah. two different projections, and the crispness yeah. blew me up. Like, yeah, I just it, saw the Spielberg in 4K, uh, uh, Tom Hanks, uh, Bridge of Spy, amazing. I mean, the photography is like, wow. Yeah. On, on a real 4K screen, it's really something. So that's, now, and, and I want this to be projected theatrically. For home projection, for home projection, if that was the only audience that I thought it might go to, I might not shoot in 4K. Hmm. Because honestly, 4K, even on a screen that's eight feet wide, which only the richest people in the world have, um, you, I don't know, it's, it almost feels too crisp yeah. in that environment. But in a movie theater, it's great. Yeah, and okay. the other reason is, um, it gives me latitude in post to punch in a little bit. And this is something that like a lot of people, you know, people are shooting on 8K. Why? Because they can shoot a master and they can practically punch in on a close up in that same master. Yeah. Now you really have to be spot on in your focus if you want to do that because, yeah. you know, otherwise if you're soft and you punch in, it's yeah. just going to look bad soft as well. So, but that's why 4K. Okay, cool. So let's carry on. Then we have the uh, uh, button number one, magnification. That's Okay, magnification button. If you press this, what it's gonna do is it's basically gonna blow up the screen and that just helps you check focus. You'll see it in the viewfinder or if you have a plugged in um, viewfinder like this, it, you can do it there. Cool. Uh, peaking, number two. Peaking is basically a focus tool which helps you check to make sure you have critical focus. And usually it's set to red, but they have other colors that you can use. Like yeah, like white. on the Sony 7R, I use that a lot for because I have a lot of manual lens, so you just see in red what's in focus, what's not in focus, right? Yes. But I find the magnification to be more precise than, than the focus peaking, per my own experience. I don't usually rely on peaking unless I'm shooting down at 1.2. Okay. And at which point, because sometimes it can just be distracting, and really, you know, if you have, if you correctly set your viewfinder and it's, it's matched to, you know, your, how your eye sees, then you're gonna see if it's crisp or not. Cool. So the next one is zebra. What right. is zebra? I know the animal. Yes. No, zebra, for those of you who don't know, is basically a tool that many video cameras have to help you see which areas of the image are either overexposed or approaching overexposure. So when you press it, you get this little yes. strikes. Oh, and it tells you which is... So it doesn't mean it's necessarily overexposed. It's getting close to be overexposed. Yes. And, and you can change what it means. Like, um, I kind of... Uh, had it set to 80. Okay. So any parts of the image that, you know, we talked about earlier about in the way. Oh, that's over 80% of exposure. Hmm. Roughly speaking. Um, cool. And uh, so it just it helps you quickly see that. I don't, I don't keep it on. It's more of just a quick check, but really with the waveform monitor, I rarely ever need it. Cool. You know, but it's just there as like a, let's say you're following someone around. It can just show you which areas might be pro uh, brighter than others. Okay, and I guess about the next one is WFM, which stands for waveform, I guess, and build button number four. Yes. That's what you talked about earlier. Yes. So you just press it, you see the waveform, which is a, like a real-time histogram, and you know, making sure your blacks is not crushed, your white is not crushed, and, but yes. because it's got so much semi crunch that maybe we hardly had ever the trouble. No. That's what's crazy about it. Yeah. Okay, great. Moving on, starts and stop, I guess, it starts and stop the, the recording. Oh, white balance, I see white balance here. Okay, so there are a few different white balance modes you have. Um, you have sort of, you know, and, and if you're shooting a lot on DSLR cameras, you know, you've got 
sometimes you have like shade portrait uh, n- underwater yeah. you know on the moon you know <laughs> intergalactic you have like a hundred different settings and on here you kind of have uh, incandescent or tungsten yeah. uh, you have daylight okay and then you have an a and a B to set custom white balances hmm. and then you have direct control over the Kelvin setting um, and I know um, for photographers sometimes trying to make the jump to video shooting hmm. and and again realize this isn't shooting raw so if you're shooting raw, white balance can be fixed in post whenever you want. Yeah. But when you're when you're shooting this, you're setting your white balance at the start, and you just kind of you want the colors to look natural in the scene, unless you're going for a really warm look, in which case you can kind of bump mm-hmm. it up that way. But my so, my philosophy is try to get as close to to what you're actually perceiving. Uh, so where whites are white, and do the rest in post. Whites are whites, the rest in post. Yeah. That has been my biggest difficulty as a video maker of coming from the raw world where I don't care at all about the white balance. I change it in Lightroom. Here, you have to be very careful because if you're too warm, yes, you can add blue uh, in, you know, in, F, in color corrections, but it's going to be tricky. It's good. If, if you took the wrong white balance and especially when you do like mastering close up and close up, make sure the white balance uh, matches. Yeah. So were you using the Kelvin settings to most of the times or the pre settings? If I was outside, um, I would kind of start at daylight and if it looked good, if it looked how I wanted, I would leave it on daylight. Okay. But 90% of the shoot, I would use the Kelvin setting and just set my temperature. Um, you can, it has the, it has auto white balance too, which I never use that. Never. Just <laughs> because a shadow goes over and suddenly the scene looks completely different. All right. Um, but you can also get a gray card or a white card and you put it in front so it fills the screen and you choose to set the white balance. Oh, which is that next button or what? No? It, it's on it's on it. There's two buttons to basically yeah. cycle through the wet, the white balance functions over there. Cool. Um, well, that's pretty much it. I mean, then, then you've got two wheels. What are the two wheels for? These are just wheels that you can use to navigate through the different functions. Uh, and um, like I said, when you're putting a, a DSLR L-series lens on here, that bottom wheel is already geared to controlling the aperture cool um but like let's say when you select iso you need to scroll oh. through 100 yeah. you use the wheel to scroll through it it's great so it's very easy to use yes and those are kind of the the buttons that you see on here there's a few other things um like you have a, a mic you can plug a mic directly into here okay um you have this this stand here which has two xlr inputs for mic and this is great and um you know is, is that is that Within it, with the camera. This comes with the camera. Oh, the XLR is with the camera. That's great. So you That's can right. get... and it just goes into the hot shoe mount right on the top. Um, it's got these two cables, which are fantastic now that you can disconnect them. And the C three hundred before it was fixed, and it was you know you can mm-hmm. you know was not the greatest design choice, and they they've really done a lot to fix this up. Is there a lot of difference between this buttons with some because I know you shot a lot with the old C three hundred Mark one or. If you have shot with the C300 Mark I or the C100 or the C500, you're going to pick up and know how to use this camera. There's, the only thing you will need to do is go into the menus and make sure that you're putting it on Cinema Log or C Log 2 or, you know, but that's, it's cool. pretty much, it's just, it's a much better codec. It's a much better, more robust um, capture format. As I was talking to guys in Canon France, they were explaining to me that, yes, it's called a C300 Mark II. But because of the sensor and the quality of the dynamic range, it's a whole new world. Do you confirm? Oh, absolutely. Not even a question. And, um, you know, I can only speak to kind of my peers in this regard because a lot of times, well, over the since they announced the C300 Mark II, I mean, I had really high hopes for this camera. Mm-hmm. I, um, I just, I love the Canon image. It's just, you know, I don't want to say, and, and Aerie also has a, fa- a fantastic oh, image. Yeah. I've shot on Aries, I've shot on Reds. You know, and I've shot on Sony. Canon and Airy have the nicest natural look on skin tones. It just is what it is. But the Airy just has so much more that comes with it. Hmm. And to get this package and to be able to get an image that you get with it is was phenomenal to me. I just, it, I, I have no need to go looking for another camera. Cool. All right, so what about the, uh, you want to talk about, we want to talk about the lens, but before you wanted to do something on the menus. Okay, there are a lot, look, we're just covering the, the, the sort of get up and get started type stuff. And also to answer any questions for anybody who's like, I want to shoot my independent film. Is this the right camera to do it? Because it always comes down to what aesthetic are you trying to get? You sure. Know, if you're shooting a sci-fi feature, 
maybe you want to go with a with a Sony camera or a, a red camera because just to how they hand like you know it's a little bit more video ish a little bit more everything's kind of just has this sharpness to it the skin tones are yeah, a little bit very more, sharp yeah so but once you understand these basic features once you start opening up the camera in terms of dialing into the menus there are crazy features that you can do you can push color space for specific white balances with green and magenta and mm. there's a there's just a bunch of other options that you have in there if mm. you really want to go deep deep into this camera and yeah which we're not going to cover in this already too long video okay uh, so let's talk about we have three other things that we need to cover here which is uh which i feel are important to to people wanting to make movies. actually make movies which is the only reason we're talking about this and that is lens selection okay um uh, in terms of zooms versus primes and uh mounting mounting and accessories okay okay let's take up the easy one first let's talk about mountings and accessories first all right okay if you're going to be shooting a feature film um, you need to decide on the shooting style that you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you want to go handheld, um, you could theoretically tuck this in and hand hold this and 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 use this as it is, mm -hmm. not with the cinema lens on it. But if you're going to yeah. shoot with an L series piece of glass, right? You know, you can hand hold this, and I did do that. I had to strip this down to just the camera and just the lens on it um, to get situations where we needed to be. You know, the the people who gave us the location said, "Look, we just want you to be discreet." So yeah. please attract as little attention as possible. So okay. I did that. But um, in terms of now, uh, if you're gonna mount it on a, a tripod or a slider, this is pretty much ready to go. But cool. if you wanna go handheld, there's, there's a number of different rigs out there. But um, when this camera was being announced, and I knew I was gonna be being the camera director of photography, operator, and director. Yeah, you did everything. So really crucial to me was gonna be being able to go from shoulder mount to tripod so that I would have the opportunity to talk to my, my, my actors and the crew without having to carry this thing around with me. Sure. And at the time of us doing this, the Zacuto just seemed to have it nailed. They have this base plate and you know, it really is, um, where is that thing, there we go. You know, you can just take this up and you can just go straight there to handheld do whatever shots you need to do. This is, you know, controlling rack focus with this, and then you have a that that uses the Canon handle down there okay. uh, to do that. So it's it's a good rig. So and and of all the ones that I saw, it was the one that was ready to go, and they thank you know they very kindly allowed us to use this to test this for the rig. The of this, you also have the viewfinder, which is important to talk about because this is really rough to position to get yeah. it where you need to, and you need a viewfinder. If you're shooting exteriors and whatnot, mm -hmm. you need a viewfinder that you can adjust to your so eyes. So that's the gra This is the Gradical HD. Yeah. Um, it's a bit pricey, but you, once you see what it has into it, you can understand why. It's, 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 uh, it's got a hefty price tag, but the viewfinder quality is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's also got built-in scopes and other color information monitoring. So really, you can make sure you're getting the best image. Like It's got a waveform built right into it, so I always knew where I was at. Mm -hmm. It's also got color scopes and it's you really, can put really a, good. Like a, a look on it, like a look. Yes. So it's a bit pricey, but it's it's definitely, it gives you such certainty when you're operating that what you have is in focus. Okay. So when you weigh blowing a day of shooting because you're not sure if you have critical focus versus having an excellent viewfinder, um, there's not really a choice. You're going to rent something like this yeah. or buy it. Yeah, no Zakudos, I mean, I even love the look of the Zakudos, the design with the black and red. It's pretty cool. So, and then you're back on the tripod. So, that the batteries, just as a note on that, you're gonna go through batteries pretty quickly. I would go through probably five to six Canon batteries a day. Yeah. And we just had them being cycled through charging on set. Um, a couple things to watch out for on it is um, they're just how the Canon C300 uh, mounts to the Zacuda recoil rig. There can be some play in it if the screws start to come loose and then the focus wheel is going to slip. So fortunately, it's pretty easy to adjust down here. It's got like a little ring that you can loosen to swing it in. But um, that's, you know, there, you might want to look for putting a third screw to mount the cannon to the bottom of the recoil plate so you minimize that play. Second is, um, you'll notice that this isn't exactly a, uh, a Zucuto part here. Uh, this was like, I think 50 bucks on Amazon. 
um, just to, to support the cinema lens. Yeah, they're so heavy lenses. And this is, this is just uh, one thing that I wasn't aware of is that to balance this rig on your shoulder, you're gonna need to add plates. Like you're gonna need to add a, a you know, some, some, uh, some rods and a weight, mm. you know, in the back to be able to properly balance it. This, the cinema zoom is a crazy big lens and it's, it's front heavy. So it's not, you know, when you're just using an L-series lens, you can literally just leave the, the recoil rig on your shoulder and just yeah. walk around with it. It's crazy amazing. Yeah. It's like just so easy to adjust. But um, for that, just be aware, you're going to need to get some accessories to put weights on the back if, you, if it's if important. If you go for this you. big cinema, cinema lens. Okay. okay. And so that's, that's the mounting system. And it's, it's really handy how these adjust. Just be, be aware that they can come loose if you're moving around a lot. So... Always keep a flathead screwdriver with you. Always keep an Allen key with you. And you know, if you're just doing you know simple shooting, not moving around a lot, it's never going to be an issue. But otherwise, just be aware that these can come loose if you're if you're doing a lot of running gun type shooting. Cool. So you want to talk about the lens a little bit also? Uh, that's kind of I think the last thing I want to touch upon because obviously these are crazy amazing lenses, and and frankly, at the low budget level, they're out of reach for right. for most filmmakers. It's just at least when I was shooting low budget, it was hmm. Canon L series glass was my choice or Zeiss uh, compact primes. I bought a Zeiss compact prime set, which was amazing. Hmm. And one thing that I was really curious about on this is that and we originally had asked for a set of primes and Canon had said, oh no, try and shoot the film with the zooms. Hmm. So the image quality of the zooms is crazy good. Hmm. It's crazy good. Um, and if you're trying to do a lot of setups really fast, just being able to you know, with this go from 30 to 100 is really convenient. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't really care about shooting below f2.8, it's, I would say, go for it. You, you know, you could, mm -hmm. couldn't ask for anything more. And I know a lot of productions are going more and more towards zoom-based shooting, just mm -hmm. so they leave the lens on and that's it. They never have to take it off, don't have to worry about sensor dust, mm -hmm. they're good to go. Um, that being said, um, the 30 to 105 is not going to give you, um, if you're working in tight spaces, you're not going to get as much of that room in there as possible. They make the other one, which is the 15.5 to 47, um, which is crazy amazing. When you open that up to the full 15, yeah, yeah. it's amazing. But the thing that's amazing about it is generally you kind of almost think you'd be almost fisheye at that point. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, there's almost no spherical distortion, which for me was pretty Yeah, I, I, I shot 90% of my landscape when I was kind of was a 17 to 40, and when I was doing interior design at 17 was the max I would go. I never went to 15. Right. And uh, apparently you were good at 15 with that. Yes. And, cool. and at 15, I tried to make sure that my actors were as close to the center of the yeah. image as possible, just the because of the effect, you know? Yeah. So one of the big questions that I had on this is, you know, beyond the challenge, uh, you know, that Canon posed to us of shooting entirely on the zooms was how do the zooms and primes stack up? Right. And, you know, specifically on the, the Canon, the Canon primes, the, the cinema primes, what I really wanted to know is how do they stack up against the Zeiss lenses that, that I had been used to and the Zeiss compact primes, because they're in a similar price range mm -hmm. and similar format. And, uh, Every person's reaction to a lens is always a slightly subjective one, mm. but I can say that these felt slightly warmer, the, the, the fall off felt a little smoother, um, and it's just something about, you know, Canon has a look. I don't, you know, it is yeah. a Canon look. I don't know how they do it, but I definitely know that from now on, I'm gonna have a full set of the Canon primes on, on any film that I shoot, just because, um, you know, I come from the old school, you know, zoom, zoom with the foot or the dolly, not with the lens. Right. And um, having the, the option to drop down to 1.3, uh, especially when you have low light situations is phenomenal. There were times where we were just running out of sunlight and we still needed to kind of match the basic exposure. Even if the color temperature was going wildly off, we wanted mm. to at least make sure we had a matching exposure. Mm. And without jacking up the ISO, it was like, okay, let's pull out. This yeah. was, you know. Yeah, this, this is a huge difference between 2.8. I mean, even in photography, if you do a lot of portrait, you know, 2.8, 1.4, 1.2 is, is a whole different world. That's why, you know, even when you buy the 50 millimeter, you know, the, the 1.8 version is very cheap. And then you have the, or 2.8, 1.8, and 1.4. 
is three different price like you know well yeah, the difference yeah. between 1.4 and 1.2 i think on the canon lenses is is a thousand dollars yeah it's a lot of money but it but it's really got to look well okay thank you so much there so uh i hope you guys are gonna love this movie it's coming out probably in about eight months we'll see if we go to festivals or not it was really fun shooting with all this canon and zakuto gear i really want to thank canon and zakuto again for sponsoring the movie and um Oh, I hope you will check out the Canon C300 Mark II if you have a short movie or a long feature film. It's really the camera to go to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir. Au revoir. I reached to it.